You're like the poor man's version of Jamie on Joe Rogan. You're like the. That's, you're exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna refer to you as Charles, the poor man's Jamie, but check out his OnlyFans. Big lenses. It's just a series of big lenses. Big lenses, small toes. Is that your handle? <laughs> yeah. Big lenses, small camera. <laughs> oh shit! Oh. It's a lot of shit talking this morning. It's good. Yeah, it's good. Okay. It's good to know we're the premier podcast on strength and conditioning, and I fucking we don't talk about strength and conditioning very much, other than today. That's right, which is amazing. Oh shit! All Why right, are we, we changing it now? <laughs> we welcome Stephanie Mock, the assistant athletic director for sports performance at the University of Pittsburgh, or known as Pitt. We're Pitt. So, right. assistant AD in charge of performance. Let's get into that one a little bit. Uh, when did performance and more important strength conditioning slide over into the athletic direct, director side and, and out of the uh, strength coach's office? Yeah, I know um, from the last person that was in this current role that I'm in, um, he actually was like the head of Olympic sports strength conditioning whenever they posted the position. That's why it was so intriguing for me because I was the director of Olympic sports at Mississippi State prior to this when they uh, posted this is an 80 for sports performance position. I literally, someone had called me. I had a, a contact with the head football strength coach at the time. He was at Mississippi State before uh, Stack. And I had asked like, hey, can we quantify like what this position is? And um, the assistant for sports performance is all encompassing. So I oversee strength conditioning plus uh, sports science. So I oversee uh, both halves. And I also I oversee 19 sports. So I oversee now both basketball, football and Olympic sports. Um, and then the sports science department and currently hiring a director of sports science as of right now. So exciting times and a lot of people to manage for sure. Yeah. Um, sounds well. Yeah. Many schools just separate football and let them do their own thing. What's unique about Pitt that now brings it under the fold of full athletic performance? Yeah, I think uh, our leader, Heather, like our AD, she spent a lot of time at uh, Ohio State. She was there for like eight years. So I think uh, just being around, having a certain bias towards being around really good strength coaches, uh, she has a lot of respect for our area uh, and what we can do for the athletic department. In relationships, she knows we spend a lot of time with the student athletes, right? Like certain parts of the year, we're spending more time with the student athletes than the head coaches. So she knows that and the role that we can create. So Luckily with me coming into Pitt, like I had mentioned, I already had a, a prior relationship with the, the head football strength coach, Mike Stacchiati, um, from us working together at Mississippi State. So she knew that aligning us, um, and it's not so much like, clearly I'm over the whole entire SNC department, but that's more like policies, procedures, budget. Um, she knows that we can really work together uh, and create something special. So like, for example, we're putting on, we're hosting like an FRS clinic and then a Speedworks clinic. And we have all the different SNC staff coming. It's not like, oh, Olympic sports is just doing this. Um, so I think it's a, a mutual respect that Stack and I have for one another that we want to be the best. So like, let's try to do it together. And I have a lot of respect for football because at the end of the day, they bring a lot of money for us. So I think uh, us supporting one another and, and putting our egos aside and having a lot of respect is, is where it needs to be for us to grow at a high level. How does the uh, sports science department work into this whole deal? I mean, are you guys actively using the athletes within the studies? Or are they kind of developing it offsite and then kind of using that implementation? Yeah, so I got here to Pitt um, in June, actually. So I spoke at Summer Strong where we had seen each other or a relationship occurred. Um, but so I've been here almost a year. Uh, so uh, I think coming into the landscape, I needed to do a little bit of homework of like what the head coaches thought sports science was. Uh, what did administration think sports science is and really hmm. defining it with them. Um, so explaining to them like, all right, why do we collect data? You know, so to end, um, big things for me, big rocks to answer questions, right. For the head coaches to ask better questions and then to discover new questions. And I think having conversations and allowing me to see like where the current landscape was at when I got to, to Pitt in June. Um, and then just looking at, they have relationships. We have a, a master's of sports science program. So we get master's students that work in the weight room for a whole entire year with us. So we have three that help with Olympic sports, um, two that help with basketball for men's and women's, and then one over with football along with PhD students. So we have a relationship with academia from a sports science lens, and then also uh, a relationship with the neuromuscular research lab. So they work with uh, the tactical side of things and also with our student athletes. So that allows us, like currently we're doing a, a DEXA study, um, looking at body composition, of course, and bone density. I think seeing what partnerships are already in place, um, there's already a good foundation laid whenever I got here to Pitt, but now um, with me overseeing 
both strength and conditioning and sports science. Um, definitely need to have somebody that's overseeing like all these different parties and relationships when it comes to fundraising money and donors and things like that. I definitely have a heavy hand in the presentations, but having someone um, oversee some of these younger folks, uh, these younger up and coming sports scientists. And that's why we're looking to, um, whenever I was interviewing for this spot, they told me I had two really big jobs ahead of me. One, building a, a brand new weight room opening in fall of 2024 with a sports science lab inside of that space. And then two, hiring a director of sports science within my first year. So that's that's where I fall right now, um, creating that leadership for that department. Uh, to use an NFL term, it sounds like you went from like uh, like the team side to like the front office. You know, where you were like yeah, coaching sure. athletes and now you're in this kind of front office, forward facing, fundraising relationship. It's kind of an interesting transition. 100%. I think uh, finding balance because a lot of people call me now and they're like, Steph, do you even coach anybody anymore? And I'm like, for sure. Uh, my one team that I trained the whole entire year was wrestling, you know, so definitely like a more testosterone dominant sport and allows me to keep my boots on the ground and really see like uh, application, like we're investing in all this technology. Um, is it the best investment? Can we actually see it like being involved in training? Is it realistic? So I think it's important to a certain degree to, to of course stay involved with at least one team, ideally for me, along with going to a lot of these meetings, just so I can have that practical application. I mean, not a bad team to test all this stuff. I mean, they would run through a wall. I imagine I know a few wrestlers. Yeah, and especially nuts, especially co uh, collegiate wrestling. Yeah, it's pretty competitive just because there's not that many schools that have collegiate wrestling anymore. So what tech are you guys using? Like, I'm, I'm super fascinated. Like, I mean, we've geez, we were out what at, um, um, out in uh, Pennsylvania, out in um, what was it at, at Penn? And they were big on to the Sparta deal. Uh huh. I mean, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, the, the jump mats, they had a essentially Penn had stranglehold on this tech for the whole Ivy League. That was an agreement they overpaid just to protect their performance from other Ivy League schools. Yeah. But then other schools were starting to integrate at Kansas and UT here, women's basketball with Zillner. But yeah, what else is out there other than those jump mats in Sparta? Hey, Power Athlete Nation. I need to take a few moments to thank our sponsor, Power Athlete Training Systems, for providing the best training programs on the universe, in the universe, in the metaverse. I mean, really, if this is the matrix, and I'm pretty sure we're stuck in the matrix, Neo and Morpheus are uploading Power Athlete Training Systems. I'm pretty sure they're doing field strong. What do you think, McCorkle? Oh, I agree. They are on a specific training program for what they need. And to find out what you need, listeners, head to powerathletehq.com forward slash training and take our little survey to find the perfect training program for you. So we have developed training programs specific for an archetype. You want to get jacked, we got Jack Street. If you're looking to foster and develop athleticism, we got Field Strong. If you're looking to kick the door off of hinges and smash things and cut up and just be a fucking badass, we got Hammer. If your first experience in terms of lifting weights and getting used to a barbell using a basic linear progression with Bedrock, that's the right one for you. And if you have a few miles underneath your belt, maybe a few kids, Fortune 500 CEO, or maybe life's getting a little in the way, I want you to check out Grindstone. And if your job and your desire is to fucking wad your face off, I want you to go check out Johnny Wad. And if you want to stack on a little Johnny Bot on that and hit a little bodybuilding accessory, we got that too. So what we've done is we've created this amazing catalog of services, these training programs designed for archetypes, and every one of them fits a specific user. And you know what? If you want to find that user... Go on, I want you to take the survey, and then I want you to click on and take our seven-day free trial and see which one is right for you. Best in class training. And for less than a dollar a day, mm. you get it delivered straight to the mobile app, Train Heroic. Mm -hmm. And if you want to sign up for our newsletter, you can go to powerathletehq.com forward slash or backslash? Forward slash. Forward slash newsletter. I want you to go to that, sign up for the newsletter where you can get more information, not only on training programs, get uh, discounts on shop on the merch, and really just know what's going on within Power Athlete with the Academy and some of our other initiatives. And the latest episodes of Power Athlete Radio. Which is really the most important thing. Power Athlete Radio, the premier podcast in strength and conditioning, and your resource for the best information on training, nutrition, cars, maybe some movies. Banter. And banter. I mean, we've been on other fitness podcasts, and when it comes to banter, we can fucking out banter anybody. Yes. And if you're a big fan of Power Athlete Radio, don't forget to smash that subscribe button. Hit us with a five-star review that we will read 
If on you leave air. us an amazing five star review, we will read it on air. And believe me, I love reading the reviews, uh, especially the five star ones, because it lets us know we're doing a good job. And we got some very creative listeners out there. We do. I mean, uh, that's why there are people. Yes. Throw your hat into the ring. Again, head to powerathletehq.com forward slash training for all your training needs. Take a little survey, find out what you're training for. Seven day free trial on that program and training for less than $1 a day. Thanks for Power Athlete Radio for sponsoring this podcast. <laughs> See ya. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Um, I've definitely been exposed to a lot of tech. I'd have to give credit to when I was at Clemson many moons ago. It feels like now I was there from 2013 to 2018. So I was there during like the rise of football. It was funny because I was at, I interned with um, stream conditioning at West Virginia University with football. And we had played, I think it was like 2012, we played Clemson in the Orange Bowl back then. And we beat them like 70 to 33. And that's when I was like, oh, who is this like Clemson school, you know? And then full tilt, I ended up going there um, for five years and being the assistant director and seeing football take off. And that's when we really started to get, um, when football wins, like a lot of money starts pouring in. So our budget was just, was definitely climbing at a high rate. We were able to invest in a lot of fun and cool gadgets. So it allowed me to be exposed to um, some different tech that like if I was at a smaller place with a, a smaller budget, I probably wouldn't get exposure. Um, so that's back when like force velocity profiling was becoming big. So we had purchased some 10 sprint units um, along with like looking into uh, wearable tech. So we had gotten like Omega Wave at one point, then switched to Fatigue Science. Uh, of course, Whoop's really big. And then now we're looking at investing in Aura Ring. Um, here at Pitt um, with us, like in the weight room and then also the lab. Um, we also have, like I've seen, I had four stakes, four stacks plates when I was at uh, Mississippi State. Now we have Hawken plates. And what we really try to do to be cost friendly is like with me overseeing the department, whatever we get, it's holistic and centralized. So like football has a set of plates, uh, Olympic sports, basketball, the neuromuscular research lab, we all have Hawken plates across the board. So the interface is all the same. Uh, same with conduct our AMS, uh, it centralized all our data at that hub. So um, centralized across all the different teams as well. Uh, force frame, uh, which you can do like clearly groin testing, shoulder, internal, external, they changed from groin bar to force frame. So it can be a little bit more holistic in nature testing wise. It's not just one muscle group. Uh, of course, Norboard, I think that, that of course, like kind of started, whether it's pro soccer, NFL, it's like, if you can get 500 Newtons, like you're a G, you're not going to get hurt. But We've been able to, to apply like relative to body weight with that. Um, gym wear has always been fantastic from a VDT system. I know uh, I've seen, of course, like the purchase of the world and some of the different stuff that's coming out. Um, uh, muscle lab ergo test uh, contact grid uh, for RSI testing is fantastic. I've had that at a couple of places. And then we're also looking at their timing gates to invest in that too. So definitely a lot of fun gadgets that I think allow us to, to paint a full picture of the student athlete and with us having, like, I look at Olympic sports, we have 17 different teams, like, in one space and a lot of different needs. Us being able to, to create that performance profile is key uh, and hand it over to not only the sport coach, but talk through it with the student athlete because every year that goes by, the student athletes want to know why that much more. So being able to, to really depict and, and show them that clear picture is, is really important. So those are a few different things without me completely rambling on. No, it's it's perfect. I mean, it's a whole bunch of stuff I, I've heard about three fourths of it and there were some things in there i'm like don't even know what that is i gotta nope. look some stuff sounds up. amazing uh yeah That's amazing. But, but how about workout delivery is it still the old school workout cards up on each athlete's hands that they got to draw or are those grad assistant interns just stacked to an athlete's hip and recording all the weights and clapping every once in a while oh uh, i think we do try to keep it a little bit old school still like with some different cards or sheets for sure uh, in the summertime is when it gets a little bit tricky. So like voluntary periods of time and things like that, uh, when they're going home for the summer, we do have conduct and you can program all of their training within that space. The big thing is if you give them a sheet of paper, you know, or a packet of paper, we all know they're probably going to lose it within like them traveling home. So we definitely need to get them some type of a uh, digital copy, but, uh, we do have an iPad at every rack for gym aware. So I think it's getting to a point of, we use the gym aware from a profiling standpoint of, we know we have five sets of three per squat today within this velocity range. That's what's great about gym aware is it syncs with the iCloud. So if we want to print out a report uh, after that lifting session, let's say for like the starting pitchers, uh, our head baseball coach would like a copy of like what their velocities were from a readiness standpoint, we can gym aware auto regulates and can send out a report right after the training session, which is really nice for like your meat and potatoes lifts, you know, whether they're doing clean squat, 
prep our jumps, let's say bench, um, you're able to, to go back in into the cloud and look at what they did. It's nice. You can look at like, all right, I have a, especially with like the COVID year and everyone, you have like way older athletes than you've ever had in the past. You have guys that are like 24, 25, 26 years old. You're like, holy cow. Let the type it of go. training that you need to do with some of these different guys is, uh, is definitely unique in nature. But looking at like, all right, this time last year, where were you at? Uh, and comparing that, whether it's with the gym aware, even with like Bob Potter Dexa as well for body composition. Was that because uh, people missed a year for COVID? So then they gave the NCAA gave them an extra year? On the back side. Yep, an extra year of eligibility. So we were talking about with wrestling because like it's a very aggressive sport or football, you know, where you see like some of these contact injuries and we have older guys. So I know some people were like, depending on your practice layout, they're given the older guys, uh, the super seniors, one would say like Thursday off instead of training on that day. And they can either like go in and lift or whatever makes them feel good, go sit go in the training room. But just trying to get a little bit more intelligent and strategic with some of your older athletes. I know with like the NFL, they may have athletes well, from. Yeah, I was saying <laughs> she's calling these college guys older and then they go to the NFL and you're like, you're a young guy again. Yeah. They got a crowd grind every single day. But I was an old guy in college. Well, yeah, they're holding on to that Van Wilder extra year so they don't have to go to work. I get it. No, it was great. I mean, college was a lot of fun, but uh, NFL was way more fun or well, I've seen any given Sunday. Yeah, it's just like that. I get it. Yeah, it's just like that. <laughs> well, with, I mean, we, we've had success delivering training through Train Heroic and then capturing yeah. those pretty, pretty jiggy stats on the back end. How important is it for you as a coach or a strength coach to really show the sport coaches data to help justify your success with the team, even though maybe the wins and losses aren't necessarily going your way? Yeah, I think, uh, especially with the sport coaches, like I said, I, I work with wrestling. That's not historically a big tech driven sport, right? Um, a little bit more meathead, meathead ish. But uh, I live by the quote of um, data drives conversations and then conversations drive decisions, right? So um, trying to create reports, whatever, like AMS or Tableau or whatever you may use to create your reports for your head coaches. Uh, especially in season, making them really easy to read and then also really easy to look at from like a color scale standpoint. So like red, green, yellow system, right? So uh, if they see red on the sheet, they're automatically going to look at that athlete and be like, all right, what do we need to do? You know, so we start to have conversations around whatever you're collecting on that team. If you do like a wellness questionnaire in the morning, if they're wearing catapult units, looking at training load, and then also um, talking to the athletic trainer of who's getting treatment, uh, what people look like soreness wise and things like that. So I think having these conversations and having the right people in the room. And usually I feel as if in the, in the college setting for sports psych and nutrition is really important, but usually they're the understaffed area. So it kind of falls on the head coach, the strength coach, and then the athletic trainer that's with them all the time to really have these conversations of uh, that weekly undulation or what we need to do at practice um, and really framing things as uh, observations to the head coach, you know, like the data is not do or die at the end of the day. Like it's just helping us paint that full picture. And at the end of the day, the sport coach is going to do what they want. So I think yeah. going in and being like, Hey, this is an observation that I saw with this athlete, let's say over the last three weeks, they're all trending down a lot of their different readiness measures. Um, what can we do to them undulating back up? You know, is it poor sleep? Uh, is it academic stress? Is it um, some type of like relationship stress? Just trying to really, create that picture of what's going on with them and then trying to um, really figure out and implement whether it's a, a training strategy and or a recovery strategy to get them back going in the right direction. But yeah, all head coaches have got their hat and I pay a lot of head coaches that put up for national championships and that other. So uh, egos may be raining high, but if you go in and you can show that you're bringing worth to the table and framing things as an observation and having those conversations, they can go a long way for sure. Uh, on the fundraising side, um, you said you're going to, you're trying to build a new weight room. So how does that all work? I mean, uh, is that like uh, fundraising through donors? Is it, uh, you know, I don't know, bowl games. I'm just always wondered, like, how do you put the pool of money together and go sell it to enough people to start building some amazing facilities? Yeah, no, that's a great question. That was, uh, one of the new responsibilities, me stepping into this role that I, uh, took on. Um, so Early on, a person I got here to Pitt within the first three months, I, I put together a presentation and we have like our head of fundraising here at Pitt. And I put together a presentation of all the different cool gadgets that we may want to invest in. So say we want to get a DEXA scan in the new lab that we're getting. That's going to cost a pretty penny. 
So I put together all the different items that we're interested in investing in. And I put together that presentation. I presented it to him, our head of fundraising. And then like, let's say at a football game, like he'll have conversations with different people, different donors. And, and they really try to figure out like, all right, I know this tech company or this tech guy that's like, he would be interested in getting towards like a, a train for force. I can see that you have a certain bias. That, so we put together like the different lists of what we want. And then he could really put a situation all different what their background may be and where would they would be uh, interested in investing in. So I, I really lean on him in that regard. But just first, it's like, all right, we'll put the item. And at the end, we'll have like a running total of um, like what each item costs. But throughout the presentation, we have a picture of the item, explain what it is, explain why we need it for the student athletes or how it can create a, a different um, student athlete higher level experience, you know, whether with us at Pitt. And then he kind of puts together the dots of who would be interested or intrigued in investing in what. So it's definitely a, I, our donors um, and our head of donations, he has a very interesting uh, role at Pitt for sure. With trying to oh, yeah. oh, dude. Is, is Aaron Donald his first call this summer? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Dude, if you Super walk Bowl. into the he's, pit football he's like, weight AD, room, we need a lot. <laughs> yeah, if you walk into the pit football weight room, you see a picture of Aaron Donald because he's definitely uh, a big supporter of Pitt. He trains there a lot. He was just at the spring game this past weekend. Um, his like cousin's on the team or something like that. So definitely, and he's from Pittsburgh originally. Uh, so definitely a lot of connections to Pitt with Aaron Donald. We're thankful to have him. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good alum to have. Dan Marino, Mike Didka, Darrell Revis. Larry Fitzgerald. It's pretty good. We we got Aaron Rodgers at Cal. Yeah, he's okay. Yeah, he donated like the whole <laughs> weight room. He basically just built the entire weight room. Or no, it was the uh, the locker room. Oh, with your name? Yeah, <laughs> on the locker. <laughs> so when I was uh, an active player, um, they uh, Cal he would constantly hit us up for donations, and uh, they wanted us to like purchase a locker. So like they asked all these NFL players to purchase lockers. So I donated money, and then we finally showed up like ten years later to see it. And they had redone the locker room again for uh, Aaron Rodgers. And uh, our names were supposed to be like donors on the locker. And they were like, yeah, your name's not on there. I'm like, see where my money went. And then the next time I went back, though, it was on there. I'm pretty sure they just like stuck it on there. Yeah. Oh, John Wellworth's here? Quick. <laughs> yeah. So they, they gave just... us this roundabout tour <laughs> yeah. of the whole weight room, a beautiful stadium. It, it was fucking awesome on and the tour to the point in... where we were like, Man, they're really giving us like the ten dollar tour. This is crazy. And then we ended in the locker room with no name tag. Yeah, <laughs> they feel bad about that. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Uh, I mean, it's it's managing a lot of things. I mean, think about the turnover. I mean, I, you know, I know they were embarrassed, but like, I mean, it's it has to be such a uh, like a like I always think in college, like uh, every coach is hustling every year to try to refill. You know, like the you know technically his roster of people. You have people graduate. You got to recruit. I mean, it feels like that. I mean, you're managing not only uh, your current athletes and 18 to 22 year old kids, but all these other different personalities in school and fundraising. It uh, the NFL felt, felt much more simple, where it was like to show up and do your job, and if you're not good at your job, you get to go. I mean, I can't even imagine all the different hoops for college. I mean, it seems way more complex. Steph, what do you feel is more challenging? You've been in many different Power Five schools. Is it more challenging to be a sport coach with film recruiting? games or strength coach where you got to manage different teams really invest in the relationships and you technically spend more time with the sport coach or with the or athletes the, yeah. than the sport coach yeah i think uh it's almost apples to oranges right when it comes to like the stressors like we're managing like my job dealing with like 19 different head coaches right and i i know one of my mentors he told me back in the day when i had like track and field and that was let's say seven different event coaches uh, he's like, this is kind of a teaser of like, hey, if you can handle this, then you go to an even more macro level when you're dealing with 19 head coaches, um, then you can handle it. So I think uh, we usually kind of fall in line with like, we're like the cool aunt or uncle as the strength coach to like the head coach. <laughs> we're the person that they can come have unique conversations with or maybe ask advice of like, hey, I want to go talk to coach about this. Like, how do you think I should frame it? Or do you think this is a good idea? And usually, like, clearly, we always have um, loyalty to the head coach. So we're trying to just help them navigate the space. But I think the one thing that I look at head coaches now is the, the whole new transfer portal piece and, and how they manage that. They like 
related to free agency, right? But just uh, kids are like, oh, well, I don't like my situation or I'm not playing, so I'm just going to hop in the transfer portal. Um, and I think uh, earning your spot and, and creating that special culture and uniqueness to your program and that loyalty and trust within the player and the head coach. And it's yeah, like we, like I think about when we just went to the final four this past year um, and, and our head coach does a really good job of making it feel as if everyone has a role on the team you know, so even if you aren't starting right here, right now, uh, whether you're a high level practice player or whatever else, so I think he does a really good job of making um, it feel inclusive in nature. But some kids, if you're selfish, you know, and you just want to get playing time and you want to start and this, that and the other, and you're not starting at your current place, then uh, people are just hopping in the transfer portal. So I think for the head coaches, they need to create some type of uniqueness to their program that, that makes kids want to stick around, not just for playing time, but just to be part of a unique culture and and see that it's going somewhere and I buy into it and I'm okay with, you know, training with the strength coach, like red shirting for a year and then in hopes to play the following year. So I think uh, getting creative right now throughout these times is really key for not only the strength coach, but um, if we have older athletes because of the red shirt year with COVID, but also for the sport coach when it's just so easy to hop in the transfer portal and kind of go shopping around. So. We uh, we only ever hear about, at least personally, when I'm, um, you know, seeing anything on ESPN or whatnot, like the transfer portal is usually focused in around like football and basketball, let's say. Uh, like I like what was the Cinderella team for the uh, St. Peter's? Yeah, uh, all the five of those Doug. guys. Yeah, all, all five of those. All uh, their starters went into the portal and the head coach and the, <laughs> yeah, the head and coach. I'd get his. Well, I mean, it, I mean, it, it makes sense. Those guys used it as an audition to try to go to a better team. But we hear just about the transfer portal for football and basketball. But, uh, I mean, it's a real deal for just about every sport has access to it. So is, is it just uh, a bunch of high-maintenance crybaby uh, football, basketball players? Or is it, you know, trickling down to other sports, like within women's sports? Because I, I just don't hear about that on ESPN or at least in anywhere. Yeah, I think it's unique with female sports. I think there's a lot of positives with the transfer portal because I even think about I've had – girls or gals like have a fifth year and maybe there's not a spot in like that weight class or the roster for you to start because they just didn't plan for it. I think the COVID year is the one that really threw a wrench in because you have your players lined up for like three years out and all of a sudden people can come back, but it's created a uniqueness of people getting their master's degree, like having that ability because they have a fifth year and they're like, all right, Hey, I'll, I'll go play at Susie Q school over here. Maybe it's a little bit less stress. It's not at the power five level, but they're going to pay for my master's. So I think it is, academically opening up some unique doors for the student athletes that aren't going to go play pro, you know? So I think it's allowing them to get a fifth year, get a master's, even like we have a student athlete getting his PhD because he's transferred a couple of times and has eligibility. So using it, like it's great here. They're using it in a wise way to be able to academically continue to, to move the needle forward. No, I, I was, uh, I was fortunate. I graduated in four years and I did my master's in my fifth year. So, I am definitely a big proponent of trying to get as many degrees as possible out of the university. Yeah, 100%. And like going back to school is that much harder. I always tell the kids, I'm like, when you take a couple of years off and try to go back, uh, it's not as exciting. So just try to knock it all out in a row for sure. I, I've always felt that uh, college was wasted on kids. Uh, I think you should have to go work and then they send you to college when you're in your 30s. We would have way more fun today than I would have when I was 18. I was so stressed out trying to go to school and play football. If I get to go back to college now, I'd be like, this is great kids. You stay here. I'm going to be at college having a good time. You know, like the annoying older student that keeps raising his hand and asking questions. <laughs> you're like, God damn it. Loser. Let's get the fuck out of here. Old man. <laughs> oh, cause we, we always had all these, uh, uh I'm getting my three hours worth. We're not getting out early. <laughs> well, tonight. we like, we always had these like, uh, uh, older students that are coming back and they were like, so engaged asking questions. You show up. They're like always at office hours. I'm like, Oh, and now I get it. I would have totally been that guy. Maybe they don't have office hours anymore, do they? It's probably all Zoom or virtual. Maybe. Yeah, we at, at Berkeley they had this really interesting deal where um, there was all these like really odd, like hard to find micro coffee shops. So the the kind of the the spoof was all these uh, you know your professors TAs would always have like office hours at some obscure coffee place from like eleven oh five to eleven oh seven, and uh, <laughs> they would like post it and I'd look at this place and I'm like I never heard of this place and then you'd have to like physically either ask somebody or go look for it because you know like it's not like you could google any of this stuff speakeasy coffee shop oh it was crazy all these like little hole in the wall and the dude would be sitting there of course with like his old briefcase you know satchel you know skinny jeans you know big horn rim glasses you know drinking his four shot shot espresso and then you come in and ask him questions it was cool 
Stephanie, you were a Division One athlete. How often do you reference now like your development over four years? So with the threat of this transfer portal stealing people away and being unhappy, do you ever reference the the struggles that your teams had to come together and overcome something that then led to the promised land? Yeah, I think uh, a big piece that I touch on a lot is when I was at WVU playing volleyball, um, I did have a head coaching change while I was there. So I had two different head coaches. And I just referenced to the student athletes, like, change is constant, whether you get a new head coach, whether you get a new strength coach, athletic trainer, and sports, it's constantly evolving and changing. And people staying at places for, like, back in the day, like, head coaches, like, 10 plus years, that's just not something you see anymore with things just being so competitive. And that's from, across Olympic sports as well. Like back in the day, I feel like Olympic sports, like you would have a volleyball coach, let's say 25 years ago that like coached basketball, volleyball, and like another sport and like keep it moving. Now now it's extremely competitive if you're not winning, like whether you're golf, tennis, volleyball, football, it's higher stress on the head coaches to win at a fast rate. So I think that's why head coaches are dipping their toe into the transfer portal to try to find that like one year student athlete that could be really talented and kind of change the trajectory of your career. Um, so I think it's definitely the fact that I had a head coaching change allows me to, to talk with our student athletes at a higher level because I work with programs um, that's had three different head coaches within like my five years there, you know, and just being able to, I remember I had a, I was at Clemson for four years. Um, I was able for one of the teams to be the constant throughout like freshman year to senior year for some of my student athletes and just be like a whole career because sports is just evolving so fast and I think sometimes we forget like how that impacts the student athlete so I think um me being able to relate back to that change is constant and hey maybe you had a bad rap with the last head coach but now you have a clean slate like use this to your advantage type of thing um or like if you were a starter the past two years and you have to re-earn your starting spot that's only going to make you better you, know, you should mm-hmm. constantly be improving yourself so uh, look at it as a positive, you know, whether you're in the weight room, whether you're uh, on the court or the field. So I think I really try to educate the student athletes behind the why. And I really talk about like dominating the other 20 hours of the day. So if you're at practice for three hours. Let's say you're in the weight room for an hour. Like what are you doing the other 20 hours? Um, that's nutritionally, sleep, recovery, um, academics. Um, but I think just change is constant and me being able to have that situation where I saw one head coach, you know, that recruited me you know, the new head coach comes in and I'm not their quote unquote recruit. Like, how am I going to adapt to that situation? I had seen like 12 different teammates transfer out and I was the one that stayed constant Hmm. throughout the rest of the time. So I think just being able to adapt to new personnel, new coaches and and trying to, it's hard, you know, like, don't get me wrong, but um, it's allowed me even later in my career now to hop from being a head person at Mississippi State in the SEC and now coming to Pitt in the ACC. Like, that's different, you know, academically, the ACC's a little bit more higher level, you know, and intense. And I think having more Olympic sports as well, but I think adaptation is key and it's never going to go away. So I'm thankful for it when I was playing. And then also now in my professional career too. How do you uh, stress your student athletes about taking advantage of actually getting an education? I think so many, you know, student athletes, at least, uh, you know, I saw that in football, just went to go play football and just only a fraction of them got to go play after college and yet a ton of the guys never took advantage of getting their degree and didn't necessarily take it as seriously as I thought they should have. Whereas on the other side, uh, there was no way I was, I wasn't leaving with as many degrees as possible. Like the reason I went there was to get a degree. I mean, I didn't even think about playing the NFL. It wasn't until I was in, you know, like in my third or fourth year where I was like, Holy shit, I could go do this. So I wonder, you know, having this like point of view where, you know, you were a student athlete and kind of go like, how do you stress that where you're like, I know we're out here playing a game, but get your fucking degree. And uh, like, how, like, how do you stress that? And more importantly, like, how do you put that in like an elegant way? Yeah, I think it starts out first with uh, just like caring what their actually degree is in, you know? So as a strength coach, like, are you actually asking like, hey, what are you studying? You know, and I think for us, when we're traveling on the road and things like that. Like I remember we were in the final four and our girls were taking finals, you know, that same week. So like the stress was an all time high, um, but taking interest in what they're actually studying and then also like asking how they're doing in school, you know, it's a lot of the time we're having a lot of the conversations that like sometimes the the academic side can't have just because we have to, we see them all the time, you know, like I think about wrestling, they live four times a week with me and volleyball, same thing. And so I think uh, having these conversations, acting, showing that you care. And then also 
Oh, we're lucky at Pitt. We actually have a pretty elaborate life skills program where we have like 10 people in this life skills um, space that actually take interest in the student athletes, developing them um, professionally uh, and then also like personally. So they'll fundraise like we just donated dress clothes that are sitting in our closet for the student athletes to be able to take, you know, and um, do mock interviews. But also we have uh, something set up. It's called Pitt Script for Life. So they can sign up to do different internships within the athletic department. So I think our life skills department does a really good job of, I think about like one of our, uh, there were three football players that applied to this uh, Pitt Script for Life internship program with us this summer. And actually we have a guy coming to help out and it creates more conversations with like the football side. I'm like, hey, do you even know that like these three guys had interest in strength conditioning? And um, some yes, and then some no, kind of surprising. You know, maybe it's like a little skinny guy that like gets good grades to help lift the GPA up. But I think, uh, seeing the impact that we can have as strength coaches, but I think setting up within your athletic department, making sure that you have an area like the life skills department that's taking interest in. Um, I know like our fearless leader of that department, he used to be a football player here at Pitt, actually in the Larry Fitzgerald days. So um, he oversees that department. So he can speak from example of like, Hey guys, look at me now. Maybe I did go play professional football, but after that you do, you do still need to find a job. So I think having someone that sits in that seat, um, that can speak from that experience. We're lucky to have his name is Penny. Uh, we're lucky to have Penny that sits in that seat leading our life skills department to really show from example, being a football player at Pitt and now full tilt, like having a full career and just developing human beings, um, really just being able to tackle it at all angles. But first thing it just starts out with is just as a strength coach, are you even taking interest in the athlete outside of just the X's and O's of spotting and benching, you know? Nice. Sticking with, I mean, development, but now focusing on your staff. So now you have a whole team that you get the opportunity to provide professional development and some interns with. What sources do you seek to help guide them? Is it a book club? Is it online education? Where do you seek for your professionals to develop underneath you? Yeah, so I set up um, literally our staff meetings. Like every Monday we have within the week built in, we do staff continuing education. Um, and it usually falls on like a Wednesday or Thursday, depending on people's travel schedules. So every week we're, we're putting together one hour of the staff getting together and doing some type of continuing education. So um, like the next thing I'm thinking about that we're going to do in the summer is Alex Natera's new like isometric course through Sportsmith. You know, we're going to work through that through the summer. I usually send something. We have like a group message, whether it's Slack or group me. I send in like, hey, here's three different online options that we can work through as a staff. Um, what do you guys like, like the one, like rate them one, two, three, um, but getting feedback from the staff. Cause it can't just be me like, Oh, I'm interested in this. So we're going to do it. You know, I need to have my staff give input of, are they actually also interested in it? Um, so my leadership qualities, I really try to all encompass, get everyone's feedback about what we're interested in. And then we work through that. So we do that usually Wednesday or Thursday in our staff meetings on Monday that open up with some type of like continue education blurb or something from a book. Like right now I'm working through the daily stoic. So like I have whatever that day is, we read through that message, kind of talk about it a little bit. Um, or like I open up with like a podcast I listen to and takeaways or we'll take turns. But, um, and then also once a month we'll call some type of practitioner in the field. It could be any performance area and do a continuing ed call with them. Um, so it could be the one great thing about COVID is we learned how to use zoom. So uh, we can do Zooms with people over in Australia or the UK, like we did with Jonas Dodu um, from Speedworks. And now from that, we're doing a clinic here in the States, May 1st in Pittsburgh. So I think um, it's really cool that we learn to live in this virtual society. So I think as long as you built it into your culture, like one of our core values for the staff is relentless pursuit for knowledge. So we're always continuing to learn. Um, and I create an environment within our like staff group me that has like the sports science master students, the strength staff, everyone else that we send in articles and podcasts and what you're reading. So I really try to um, embody that all of the time without overwhelming people, of course, too. But I think uh, as long as you build it into once a month staff professional development calls, once a week, we'll do um, some type of like working through an online course, um, building it in and really making it a habit. So then say if my uh, assistants go take head jobs. I just had one actually do it the other day. Like she can encompass that and take that on where she's going as well. Cause the field's evolving at a fast rate. And if you're not keeping up, whether it's with the tech, uh, with the training, um, you're going to get left behind or sport coaches are going to come to you asking a question about something. And if you can't answer it, 
and then they may not see value in you and you might be around all too long. So I think just making sure that we're setting ourselves up to be a, a really high resource to the athletic department. And that's just going to be a relentless pursuit for knowledge all the time. Is, um, is the strength coach hired by the sport coach or is it kind of hired by your department and then you're provided or how does that all work? Or is it kind of a symbiotic relationship to try to find the right people? Yeah, it's definitely unique. Um, you'll see in men's basketball and football, usually that head coach has their guy, right? Um, and just making sure clearly like they need to be certified and safe, you know, to come in and train the student athletes. Uh, women's basketball is kind of up in the air. Like whenever I had hired that position here at Pitt, I worked hand in hand with our head women's basketball coach of like, he entrusted in me, like step, go find some studs. And then I found them and I was like, all right, I trust in these three people that they're going to kill it if they get the job. So kind of, I'll put it in your hands. I'll ask the right questions. You ask the right questions and then we'll come to fruition and make that decision. I think Olympic sports is unique because usually your assistant or someone on your staff, it's not just with that one team. They usually have a couple of teams. So how I have it laid out at Pitt is like, we have a, a soccer strength coach. So um, her name is Brenna. She has men's and women's soccer. So that position is a little bit more encompassing with return to play energy system development. That's like her niche, but also that's, what's important for that sport as well. And some type of like GPS tracking, uh, she had used catapult historically. So coming in and utilizing that is pretty seamless. Um, another position is a little bit more rotational sport oriented. So like a baseball, softball, um, working with one of our other assistants and then another one being like swim and lacrosse. Um, so I think that's more of like the sport science esque position along with, uh, just personnel. Like I try, I try to really make sure our staff is well-rounded. Um, so everyone's bringing their, um, specialist type ideal set. And then also that goes along with our like continuing education pieces. Whenever people come in and pick something, it's like, all right, I know Brenna's always going to bring something that's more return to play. Aaron's going to bring something from sports science. Taylor's more uh, rotational profiling and things like that. And then I'm just more of a generalist at this point in my seat. So I think making sure the staff's well-rounded, but then also making sure um, I really try to drive it off of like the four F's. Um, so looking at like fit, do I envision this uh, strength coach being able to fit in like in the locker room uh, with the coaches and things like that. Uh, and then really just understanding like when you're talking with the sport coaches um, and the performance team, making sure that you can have these conversations at a high level. So fit, uh, future, making sure they have that growth mindset. That's really important. You know, do you see yourself as a director down the road? You know, if not, I don't really know, like if you want to be stagnant in nature, this program is probably not for you. Um, function, can you just do the job? Like, do you know the sports at a high level, you know, and then also feel like, can you get around the guys or the gals actually feel out what that culture is like? Um, so, before us, I got that from, I was talking with a guy named Angus with the Blue Jays. He's over their high performance team. And I thought like, I've been hiring a lot of positions as of recent, but really trying to encompass like those different, those four Fs to see if they're going to be a good fit for not only just the strength staff, but you're working with the, the all-inclusive performance team as well at a high level. So just making sure you can do that. I think this is a good time for our fun questions. Oh, good. And quick <laughs> side note, Steph, if you're looking for an exclusive online education experience specifically for athleticism, we've got you covered. I'll follow up with that via email. But now I want to get into the fun interview questions. Now this feel, the final F that you introduced, that's one of the most challenging things with developing a team is finding someone that is willing and also able to hang out with you for eight hours a day or as we call them, power athlete, the layover test. Mm. If we got to go travel halfway across the world, there's a flight delayed and I got to be with this person for an extra difficult trip. Are we going to fight or are we going to, you know, get some big boy sodas and, and uh, figure, figure out and solve the world's problems. So like, what are some fun questions that you give your interviewees that help establish, Oh, this person's, we get a good feel about this person. Yeah. No, I think when they come on campus in person is, is really nice for like the full-time positions. From a field standpoint with a student athlete, of course, we'll have them like train one of our current student athletes or our interns, um, which gives us a good feel. Like when we have our interns, if they're coaching them through like a back squat or through a warm up, we'll tell the interns to do some things purposefully wrong and seeing how they react to um, them a little bit acting a fool, right? So it's like, all right, you're squatting and they're purposefully bringing their heels up or whatever else, like seeing how they handle that situation, I think on the floor 
Uh, and then big thing for us is just uh, clearly when you go out to eat, you know, whether it's like what they order, like how they order their coffee. Do they drink coffee? Like I love coffee hence I have it here. Um, I'm like, oh man, I don't drink coffee. I don't know how I feel about this. So yeah, uh, I think that's, <laughs> that's always interesting. Um, one interview question that I thought was super unique. I actually got it as interviewing for a position and I added it in was uh, like, what was your first car that you drove? I think that tells a lot about like, kind of like your upbringing, you know, were you driving a car that was like a beater that had like wheel deal when like winding down the windows and, and whatever else I've heard some really interesting, um, comments with that. Another one is looking at like, all right, Hey, if I take you out to eat as the boss, like, what are you going to order? Are you going to get a steak, a burger? Um, so trying to see like that as well. Oh, so ask, um, like in a group setting, like, Hey, how do you fall? Or usually the person that's like loud telling the stories, you kind of sit back in the corner and you're just like drinking and chilling. Like, where do you fall in that conversational setting? Um, so I think another one is, so if a student athlete comes to you, like complaining, are you, are you apt to just like tell them what they want to hear? Or are you actually going to tell them like the real truth, seeing how they react to that as well? Cause I want some people that are real, you know, in nature, but, um, yeah, big boy drinks. I think that's really funny. But uh, yeah, those are just a few examples of, of some questions. And well, that's we one of the power athlete rules. What's your drink? You got to yeah. have a drink. So that's one of my deals is uh, and I like I try never to fall prey to this. But, you know, like the bar or the way, you know, waiter or whatever comes over and goes, oh, do you guys want a drink? There's always people that like don't have their drink. And then you sit at the table and you're like, how have you gotten this far without knowing what you're going to order? I mean, unless you're like, oh, let me get a drink list. I'm at some place weird and they might have like some like craft cocktail that I'm going to see what they got. Well, yeah. My first question, do you have ginger beer? Oh. If the answer is yes, I got an Irish mule. If the answer is no. You just get the mule? No, I'll do a Jameson and ginger. Uh, uh, the uh, the car one's funny because uh, one of my trucks has manual windows and my kids think it is hilarious. They get in there and they're like, what are these things? And they're like having to crank it up and down and they... Uh, <laughs> They hate riding in that truck for one reason. The windows, you have to actually, they're like these things that make them go up and down. And I'm like, oh my God, you guys are so spoiled. What, Steph, what was your first car? Oh, it was like this terrible Cobalt, like Chevy Cobalt that had that windows. A terrible color too, to be honest. Was it four-door? Like, that's a big Chevy guy. Was so it sorry, a four-door? What? It was a four-door, so that's positive. Yeah, no, uh, that's a real piece of shit. Uh, a four door Chevy <laughs> Cobalt. Uh, I and, and I know this because I'm a purveyor of piece of shit cars. Like I, uh, I like no obscure things and like Chevy Cobalt four door. That's pretty. Well, that's my, pretty good. My follow up question: What did you have hanging from your rear view mirror? Ooh. I got five sisters. Each on, one of them on. had their own unique deal. Uh, what is it? Uh, beads. Uh, um, rosary lays like lay, a okay. lay, lay. Uh, fuzzy uh, you could say dice but then there's also like square pictures so like four different pictures just rotating in a square I'm just giving my is, sisters examples is, is that what your sisters had oh I, yeah I think that's a girl thing because my wife has uh, like these bead necklaces around her rear view mirror and as soon as I get in the car to drive I take them off blind spot yeah, yeah. And, and like there's shit swinging everywhere. And she's like, why does that bother you? I'm like, ah, I don't fucking know. <laughs> she she might not have anything behind a rear mirror. Yeah, that's not that's not my swag. I do have one of those phone holders in my current vehicle because I huh? FaceTime all the time when I'm driving. Literally one of my interns got it from me because she was riding with me in the car. We were going to get Starbucks. <laughs> and and you're like. And I'm like <laughs> FaceTiming, driving. And she's like, Steph, this is such a liability. And I'm a terrible driver, 100%. Um, so literally like that following year, she had taken another job somewhere else. She sent me in the mail, one of those like phone holders. She's like, this is just for your safety. That's what I have chilling in the middle of my car. Um, yeah. I think that it's not that women are bad drivers. I just think that they try to do too many things while they're driving. Like there's coffee, there's a phone. There's like, I, I've like the amount of times I've pulled up and seen like women, like putting, like driving with their knees, putting on makeup, like trying to like handle things. I'm like. It's not that women are bad drivers. I just think that you like are not just too. They're too good at multitasking. Oh no, well, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm. I'm not. Yeah. Like if, if I'm in the car, I'm driving. Like a lot of times, I forget to turn the radio on because I'm focused on driving. What's a radio? I also drive a manual transmission, which is another thing. Which that, that's another thing. My kids find it hilarious. There's a stick that's in the middle of the car that you shift that you move around, and I'm like, 
yeah, it's called a gear shift. And they were like, that's so weird. I'm like, oh God, you guys like, uh, yeah. But uh, no, that's, I, I just think women try to like my, my wife's classic example. There's way too many things happening at one time for her to be driving. And I'm like, I just think that you guys are distracted. No, I can agree with that. I think about many moments and I'm doing five things at once. Yeah. So. And then you're in the car and you're like, yeah, I'm just autopiloting. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's fine. You're like, wait, how did I get here? <laughs> yeah. That's not good. Uh, <laughs> I was like, like what was if, that red or I just had the weirdest dream. <laughs> you know, you're driving, <laughs> right? Uh, what about going to Starbucks? Has this ever happened to you? Uh, I, I went to Starbucks uh, with some people. And uh, I'm like uh, uh, black, no cream, Americano, like tall. Like I get the same thing. Like I drink yes. black coffee. And uh, I've been with people that order these fucking overly elaborate, like 4,000 calorie half shot of this and, you know, double half cap. This, you know, I mean, like to the point where I don't even know what the fuck they're ordering. All I know is it costs $18. And uh, I like I, that's like a dead giveaway for me. If like that's like your level of complication for a drink. I don't know if we could be friends or I could work with you. That is an excellent interview test. Let's go to Starbucks. Yeah, yes, hey, no. You, you get your drink. I mean, I, she she very well might be a, a really complex. Mine's would, a grande americano. You okay, can't see boom. it, but it's black. It's Hot. black yeah. like my soul is what I tell myself. So. <laughs> Do what's your take on iced coffee? You know, <sighs> Pittsburgh is cold, so like I'm until it gets to it snowed the other day, like on Saturday. So like I'm still drinking hot drinks. But I can get down like the nitro cold brew. I really was thinking in the new facility, like, what if we had that on tap and people would just come in? It's and dangerous. Uh, so he, he drinks uh, iced coffee all the time, which just makes me feel like old coffee that you just threw an ice cube in. Yeah. Like every time I drink cold uh, brew. No, like freshly brewed hot coffee, freshly brewed cold coffee doesn't necessarily exist. And if it does, I don't necessarily want it. I like hot coffee. No, no, no. You heat it and then you pour it over ice and then you slurp it. I'm not going to wait. No, I need no, to no, inject. No, 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 no. Every time we go, they're like, you want it ice or cold? I'm like, yeah, you drink coffee hot. Like as hot as you can get it to where it's burning your mouth, even when it's 100 degrees out. That's what no. they do in Texas. No. I can get on board with that. Dude, I um, also, I, want I, need to send you guys, I need to send you guys some coffee. The best thing of Starkville, Mississippi. I don't know if you guys have been to Mississippi, but it's quite the place. Best thing was Strange Brew Coffee. They have blueberry cobbler coffee, which is way oh, it's I've so had good. Strange so Brew Coffee. I'll send you guys some. I, I, I've, I've had strange brew cro- uh, coffee. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah. No, I mean, we'll, we'll definitely take more. Um, I went to an event that was in Mississippi and I, I think they have one in Memphis. Oh, uh, that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. My stepdad's from Meridian, Miss. That's the only town city I've been in. I have no idea where it is. Meridian. Yes. I got to look up on a map here. The Mississippi connection. Uh, he went to Southern Miss. So uh, years ago, we were uh, in, I was out in Central California at my buddy's ranch. He has uh, like 18,000 acres in Central California. And uh, we went out there to go hunting. And it was middle of summer, like 100 degrees, Central California, which people don't realize is like uh, the Midwest, Texas. It's just fucking hot. And so uh, the it, kind of an interesting deal, he put together about four or five ranches over about 20 years and, and then allowed the people that he bought the ranches from to continue to live there. And so... Uh, like the middle of the day, he's like, Hey, we got to go cut firewood for, I can't remember the lady's name. Um, but she was like, uh, I think in her nineties and her and her husband had got that land when they were like 18 and 19 years old and had worked that land for, you know, forever. And so then her husband passed away and he ended up purchasing their, their land and assembling his ranch. And then she just lives there. And so, uh, she was like real big on like had a fire burning it didn't matter all year round burned a fire. So we had to go out there and cut all this firewood and they had this like old wood splitter. So I, I hadn't stacked and cut firewood like that in years. And so we're out there like middle of the day. Uh, like, you know, we dragged all these trees. We, uh, you know, cut them up with chainsaw, put them in the splitter, split a bunch of stuff. So it was like a legit six hour day to get this lady enough, like two quarts of wood. And, um, she kept coming out and bringing us like uh, hot coffee. And it's like, mind you, it's a hundred degrees. And she's like basically bringing this coffee out that, like the spoon stands up when you stir it, you know, it was so thick. It was like she hadn't cleaned like the coffee pot probably in like 10 years. And it was just like, it, it was like sludge. And so we're out there drinking. It's like a hundred degrees. I'm out there drinking this like piping hot coffee in like the middle of the day. And she like just kept bringing us more and more coffee. And I'm like, I had like once, like one cup and it was probably strong enough to be good for like, maybe like heart palpitations for three days. And she just kept bringing this stuff out to me. And I was like, man, if I keep drinking this woman's coffee, I just remember thinking like, 
these people are way tougher than us. Like this is, she's like, oh, my husband used to drink hot coffee all the time. What's wrong with you guys? And we're over there like sucking this stuff back. When we're cooking, you would have fucking died. Yeah. What did the old shot over the shoulder? So uh, I have zero uh, sense of temperature in my mouth. Like I can drink like the hottest coffee just like without even a blink. And to the point where I'll troll people, they'll like give us coffee and I'll go pound it and they'll like look over and then like spit it out and it burn their mouth. Yeah. The, so. well, that's a pretty good interview is to go chop some wood and carry some water, like literally. Well, the other weird thing is how many people we've been around that can't, that, that have never split wood and don't know how to swing an ax. That's always a funny one. And I'm like, you guys have never, like, like when we were kids, this is, this is wild. My dad would, uh, uh, like periodically, um, like had a, a comedy, like we, we had a wood burning, um, uh, like furnace. A, no, not a wood burning <laughs> furnace, but we had a, a, like, like a big fireplace. And because our, like the home that we lived in, uh, was kind of weird. It was like a house and then they had like an outdoor patio and they just put like a cover and enclosed it. So only like half of the house got heat. And we were also pretty sure that my dad just uh, disconnected the heater because our home was always like 60 degrees. It was always ice cold. So uh, we had a, a like we would burn a fire all year round. And this is crazy. I, I lived in California. But like at least once a year, maybe every two years, we would come home and there'd be like a mound of firewood in the driveway and uh, like blocking everything. And we had to come home and we had to stack it before my dad got home to pull his car in or he'd be pissed at us. And so, like, that type of stuff of, like, splitting wood and stacking it and being like, oh, fuck, trying to, like, rope our buddies in. Like, hey, you guys want to help? They're like, fuck you. Huck Finn painting the white fence. Oh, it's dude. a great time. Yeah, stack. So, like, it was wild. Like, all of a sudden, they show up and they're like, have you ever done this before? I'm like, take me back to my childhood. All so, right. my dad's not going to come home and yell at us. Steph, where'd you grow up? I grew up north of Pittsburgh, actually. So, I'm from this area. Like, We're return minutes. home. But we had a, a wood furnace, so I can connect with you on that one. We had to, like... There was uh, it heated the pool, the house, and my dad's garage. So I nice. split some wood in my day, 100%. I can connect with that. Literally, we had to like cut trees down and cut wood up. My mom wouldn't let us get in the pool until we like did some hard labor, aka like pulling tree branches and cutting stuff up. So I can feel you on that one for sure. Oh, yeah. I grew up in this area, so I'm kind of back home, which is pretty cool. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I have enough firewood for about 100 years here on this property. It's stacked everywhere to the point where uh, Kelly Starrett came for dinner. And his family, his daughter was in town looking at UT and they came over for dinner and they were like, Hey, you want to have a fire? Cause it was kind of a little cool. I was like, yes, I got all this firewood to burn and just threw it in. And it was so dry. It like exploded. They're like, wow, this is great. Burn bands on dude. Is it? Yeah. Well, I wasn't like, uh, burnt. I, I'm like, not like, the, uh, you know, in my cauldron, I wasn't, oh. I wasn't bored. Um, I have this thing called a cowboy cauldron. It's like a huge weld cap and, uh, what? it's like an outdoor fire thing. But no, it wasn't the burn pile. That would have been mm. fucking great. Yeah. Hell so yeah. what? So that, that's another wild thing here in Texas, which is so different than California. You can actually burn like huge piles of like uh, wood and like just anything. These burn piles in California, they would fucking arrest you with felonies if you did that. So like the first time we came out and spent and lit that thing, I was like freaking out. I'm like, dude, we're gonna get arrested. He's like, no, 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 it's Texas. You're allowed to do this stuff. Just get a hose. Yeah, that's wild. So you grew up outside Pittsburgh. Nice. Uh, uh, one of my teammates, Hank Fraley, uh, he played at Robert Morris. Yeah, Bobby Mayo. That's what they yeah. call it. Yes, yes. Have you guys had a Permani sandwich? Of course. I, I played for the Eagles. Oh, really? Yeah. No. And so we, whenever we would, uh, uh, in the preseason, we would always play Pittsburgh. So it was, it was just a short trip. And there was always this like big like cheesesteak Permani brothers deal. I thought they were both awful. Yeah. I'm like, it's just a sandwich with a bunch of fries on it. And I know people listening to this are going to be like, oh, my God. And I'm like, it's just like the cheesesteaks. Like, I, I found that if you eat too many cheesesteaks, uh, all, all you got to do is show up at the cheesesteak place at like 1 a.m. to see what you don't physically want to look like in this world. And then you just get out of line with the cheesesteak. 100%. <laughs> uh, yeah, people always say it's overrated with the fries and the coleslaw and, and all that jazz. Well, but I guess growing up on it, it's, it's like. It, it's good. It's just it's really messy. Which I think, like, you got to, like, prepare yourself for the mess. And, I mean, it's good, but it's, like, not, like, uh, I mean. If I'm only traveling to Pittsburgh, I could get one, but I only go once every five years. and Yeah. Uh, there's better places in L.A. for sandwiches. Like, there's this place called Felipe's French Dip. <sighs> Unbelievable. I mean, there's some really good spots, but I, uh, I'll definitely say that, uh, um, I mean, obviously, like, Yingling beer. Oh, I mean, yeah. having lived in Pennsylvania. and uh, uh, you know, Steph, are you Yingling or the Steel City Garbage? Oh man, the icy light. You gotta get icy light. Uh, it's terrible. But it's so what we're known for. 
So they just started selling yingling down here in Texas. Uh-huh. And uh, so I bought it, like a couple cases of it. And uh, we just got some work done. These dudes came and like welded up the carport, like total Texas, like a pipeline dudes. And after I was like, hey, you guys want some beers? So I pulled out the yingling and they were like, oh, what's this fancy beer? And I was like, give it a try, <laughs> you fucking hillbillies and knuckle draggers. And then they cracked one and they each had like three and they're like, this is pretty good beer. I'm like, yeah, the Yankees do good beer. They were uh, oldest brewery in America. I know. They, they were pretty Pottsville, upset. Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Yeah. You ever been to Pottsville? No, but Matt Zanis won't shut up about it. <laughs> so we, when I played no. for the Eagles, our training camp was in Lehigh. So like Allentown, okay. Lehigh and that whole area, like I got a, a chance to explore it pretty, pretty well. It's, it's a cool uh, part of the world. Back to the interviews. Uh, what's funny is Callie and I's interview with John was a, to- a cheese steak tour of Pen- uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. South Philly. And like following a nutrition lecture about paleo and, you know, bread is bad and gluten, the devil. What I said then we was go- we were eating a performance-based diet and there's no point where I could find a performance gain from consuming massive amounts of gluten. Also true. So then we show up at one, two, three different cheesesteak places. Is this a test? Well, needless to say, we each consumed three cheesesteaks and well, so here we are. So we, we did a, a seminar in Philly and I had a whole bunch of people and having lived there for years, uh, there's like a, like me going to South Philly's like, like opening up a, a closet and finding like a really like old leather coat and like slipping it on and being like, Oh, like reaching in your pocket and finding 10 bucks. And then like, Oh, I haven't worn this coat in a while. It feels just like it used to like, that's yeah. like me showing up in Philly. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I lived in, uh, uh, center city, Rittenhouse square, uh, you know, Manioc, like the whole area. And so like in working in South Philly, we knew like every back end place or black alley place. So I took these guys, I'm like, Hey, I'm going to take, um, so when we were going, some of our buddies wanted to come cause they were like, man, we, you know, we want to like see like real South Philly. I'm like, great. We'll do a steak, uh, uh like a cheesesteak tour. I'll take you guys to like Tony Luke's. We'll like, uh, we'll go get that like tourist garbage, uh, Pats and Geno's. And then I'll take you to gyms in South, which is pretty good. They do onions. And, uh, so these guys were interning. So they show up, they're all nervous. The other problem is I drive really fast. Like, uh, like the wolf, you know, from, uh, um, Pulp Fiction. from Pulp Fiction where he's like, oh, it's 20 oh minutes away. Gosh. I'll be there in seven. So like, and especially in South Philly, uh, stop actually is an acronym for slow to observe police. So you like you don't stop at a stop sign. You just kind of slow down. You touch your brakes. You kind of glance and you just blow past. And uh, and then there's also like there's one way streets. Like there's a whole fucking just way you drive in South Philly. And uh, I, I like jump in the car. I'm like, follow me. Not really thinking. Holy shit. Like, I, I don't know these dudes. Like, uh, like, I don't know how they drive. Little did I know that, uh, uh, you know, text drive slow enough to drive Miss Daisy. And uh, Callie, who was with him, was is no better. So like they jump in the car and I like put my foot to the, you know, to the ground and like being blow out. And they're like, where the fuck did this guy go? And then they see me like shooting down side streets, not stopping at stop signs. And they're like, what the fuck? So they thought I was trolling them, you know, trying to like fuck with them on the interview. And then they asked me and I'm like, no, 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 that's just how we drive in South Philly. You don't stop. You just slow down to observe police or pedestrian, whichever you think. And I took them on this cheesesteak tour and just got them some like hellacious, like get them like whiz and just kind of you know, gave them like the full experience of living in South Philly, which uh, was a lot of fun. It was a good time. Oh, I had a great time. That's awesome. Uh, well, Greenville's Clemson's in Greenville. That place is beautiful. I had a interview at Furman university way mm-hmm. back in the day. And yep. Oh my goodness. It's in my top five places to live. Charleston's I mean, just, better. I would say uh, it's kids. a little bit too party hardy for me. I like Charleston. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll go have a weekend there, but like live, I need, I want low stress, slow. What do you uh, not of these stopping? Wait a minute. Police. Why? Why do you need uh, low stress? You have like the least stressful job in life in the world. That's um, yeah. That's what I aim to accomplish. I've done it. <laughs> Check that box. Dripping Springs, yeah. seventeen hundred people. It's great. Joe Rogan, shut up about it and keep them out. What? Uh, that's me telling him yeah, what to yeah. do. Well, uh, uh, so we live here in Austin. It was like a kind of a cool town, and then about two or three years ago. Uh, Joe Rogan moved here and now like everybody that listens to his podcast is trying to move to Austin. So like the growth curve that they expected in 10 years happened in about six months. Yowzers. No bueno. <laughs> oh my God. It's uh, like, it, it's like uh, every day I get on the road, it's like trying to leave a concert. You need, you it's know, like easy. when you pull into the concert, like you kind of pull in, you're like, Oh great. We park and everything. And then you're trying to leave and there's just a mass of people and you're like, so it's so easy to get here. How can I not it's, get out? It's a good analogy. It is. It's like trying yeah. to leave a concert. 
Everyone I mean, uh, would always rave because we go there for Texas Relays about like the Voodoo Donut place. Is that place actually legit or is it overrated? Uh, I think if you're stoned, if you're yeah. really high, <laughs> I because I mean, uh, uh, and, and I, I know this because I went to Berkeley, but uh, uh, the first time that like people talked about when we first moved here, uh, my wife and kids are big into donuts. Oddly enough, gluten-free donuts, which is really fucking hard to find here in Texas. So they were like, hey, let's try this voodoo donut place. So I go in and um, uh, my wife and kids are waiting in the car. We kind of just double parked to go in. The dude in front of me was so fucking high. He couldn't verbalize what he wanted. So he had to write it on paper and show it to the lady. And uh, it was like uh, a donut with um, Captain Crunch cereal and all these wacky shit. And uh, it was just like it, like the people that built the menu were total stoners. And the people that show up there are high as fuck. And, uh, yeah. like this dude was so baked and like, finally he got like these things and he just kind of like when they handed it to him, just like went to the nearest table and like just started mashing him in his face. And I asked the lady, uh, I was like, how high are people? She's like, dude, you have no idea. Like these people are on a whole other fucking universe. This entire donut place is dedicated. It, she's like, this wouldn't work if marijuana wasn't such a deal. Like this, like this works because people are high as fuck. And, oh uh, I was like, well, I'm just looking for some gluten-free donuts for my kids. And the lady was like no just go like wrong place like we right. don't have gluten-free you're not high it's kids like it, just get the fuck out and i was like okay oh, it's east sixth street dude look at some of the things pull it up yeah it's like uh they got like captain crunch cereal they had like a peanut butter and jelly like uh, uh fr- like they're just like the wackiest shit and i'm like closes at 3 a.m it's it, it's like stoner it, food you can get it delivered the fact of the video right now uh, I've never been, but the kids were raving about it. I was like, well, no, nice. I mean, like, I figure they all smoke weed. So, I mean, Matt Vincent <laughs> told me like I didn't. Um, so my claim that this is kind of interesting. I've never, ever ordered food online, you know, like delivery. Uh, I just never ever ordered yeah. other than pizza. Well, I did order pizza, but that was on the phone and I had to call. Like I've never actually used a computer to order food. Can you believe or your phone? Or, well, I just, why not? Yeah. Uh, but Matt Vincent told when he came on the podcast, told me that there's a place that they deliver hot, fresh cookies any like 24 hours a day to your house. What it, Tiff's Treats, this has been around since like I was in college. This is I, I've 15 never years. Even, I, I've never even heard of this stuff. Like, can you imagine like 10 o'clock at night being like, I want a box of cookies? Well, and they, calling and having delivered to your house? Yeah, they basically invented, invented Uber Eats. Like, this, this is way back. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, I just think like, it's a lot of people smoking weed. That's the only thing I can think of. There's like, I'm not sitting there being like, man, I wish somebody would deliver a whole box of cookies. Matt Vincent's like, oh yeah, you got to be real high for that. Uh, so they probably work in college towns. Yeah, I'm looking at oh, Captain, my Captain is this Captain Crunch donut? Yeah, that's the one. My Vicious hibiscus, black. I don't know, half black sprinkles, cake donuts. We got uh, Marshall Mathers, M and M donut. Anybody? Uh, triple. No, I I got the joke. Triple I got chocolate. Joke. I got it. I got it. Penetration <laughs> chocolate cake donut with cocoa frosting and cocoa puffs. Diablo Rex chocolate cake donut with chocolate frosting, red sprinkles, and a vanilla frosting pentagram, which is the like that Satan worshiping star. Yeah, dude, I know what a pentagram is. I'm talking to our listeners, dude. I don't know. I didn't know. <laughs> what uh, most of our to listeners to listen to heavy metal. I didn't I mean, know what a pentagram was until I went to voodoodonut.com. You didn't know what a pentagram? You'd never been to like a Slayer show or anything? <laughs> no. Dude, did you know Slayer played the Grammys? Uh, no. I can't believe that. I, I Maybe it was a spoof. I, I still can't believe it. And, they played Angel of Death. And there was like the Kardashians out there rocking. And I'm like, oh my God, Slayer's are the Grammys. All right. This is probably the only donut I would get. Uh, PB&J. Yeah. Raised yeast shell filled with raspberry jelly topped with peanut butter and a side dip of peanuts. That's about the only one I would go for. Here. That's what the dude had. He got that in the Captain Crunch and was smashing him. He would tell how high he was. They also have a, a go tart. It's like a uh, donut pop tart. Oh my goodness. So this this, uh, this last weekend, um, this is kind of random, but uh, one of my <laughs> power buddies. Power the radio. Yeah, this is power of the radio. <laughs> one of my buddies, uh, like one of the guys that trained at our gym back in California, um, he is Snoop's partner, uh, Snoop Dogg's partner for his production company. So he puts on Snoop's show. So Snoop was coming to Austin and was like, hey, uh, I hit him up. And he's like, great. 
it, it was a Snoop Dogg, uh, Too Short, Ice Cube, and E-40. And so it was in this thing, like it was called the uh, Round Rock Amphitheater, which was really just an open field behind a J.C. Penney in Round Rock. <laughs> like the <laughs> single most North fucking, Austin. Dude, North Austin, most ghetto thing I've ever been to. We like, like the Ubers driving us around. I'm like, where the fuck is this thing? It's behind like a JC Penny, which I didn't even know existed anymore, and a uh, Panda King. And it was just an open field with like a, uh, like, like a fence. And so we finally, we, we show up to this thing and um, like, you know, thank God we had some VIP tickets. So we go in, there's kind of like a bar area and they're playing on this stage. They had like scissor lifts with like, with lights because they didn't have like a light stage. So they had to scissor. It sounds like a power at the radio Dude. production. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the funny part is, like, normally at that show, you would, like, expect to, you know, just be, like, the like a smoke, like a green cloud smoke of marijuana, right? Like, that was just what I expected, except it wasn't. It was just the sweet, stinky, disgusting smell of vape. Like, have you ever been around people and vape, and you're like, oh, it smells like, like, disgust? Uh, no, closest thing, I've been in a hookah bar. And then walked out. Okay. Well, like vape is like, so they like have these chemicals and they vape them. And the interesting thing was like, you, I've been around people that were on drunk or, or high or on drugs. Like you kind of like get an idea of like what somebody's on. These people were fucking zombies. And so there, there were cops next to me. And I asked the cop, I'm like, what are these people on, man? He's like, he's like, dude, they're vaping whatever is in there. And we don't know half of the shit until we arrest them. And we do some toxicology reports. Um, like, like the, like, like the drug scene has gone through the roof. And uh, I asked him, like, what's up with all the vaping? He's like, well, you can't legally smoke weed here in Texas. So people are just putting the THC in the vape as like, a, you know, as the kind of the, the hide on it. And I'm like, man, California's other places are so much more just open. Like, I would much rather show up in like, you know, a bunch of people smoking weed and like, like in that environment than just a bunch of like sweet smelling vape, which was awful. They're like, hey, you guys want to go backstage? I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. We're leaving. I'm, I don't want any smell being around this vape stuff anymore. But it was a pretty cool show. It was cool to see Snoop. He's a yeah. Steelers fan. You didn't know. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know it, that. So. Yeah. It was good. Uh, does music ever come up on the interview, Stephanie? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Usually, um, if we have time to train, I like for them to, like, bring some clothes to train in and get a lift in. So, I think exercise selection and then also music can tell you a lot about a, a candidate as well as you uh, guys you know, give us some background like uh if they come in like like what are you expecting and more importantly how are you judging them yeah i think um it's funny like men and women can be a little bit different right i'm a lady strength coach actually they call me in mississippi the lady weight coach this is our lady weight coach here i'm like oh my goodness um so it's been interesting i think it's more of like a the whole staff will train and just hearing the feedback from the staff of like, Oh, this guy did split squats. Like what the heck? Like you didn't do bench or this or that. So I think just like getting the feedback from the whole entire staff around the exercise selection is always quite humorous in nature and how strong they are. Of course is another one. Um, so at the end of the day, like we're all strength coaches. So you hope people train hard. Like you wear your suit. I say a lot of the time. So I think that's important. And I think, uh, Music selection is always an interesting one as well. Like when they go over, they feel comfortable playing. Like, um, like you were saying, some type of like clearly very intense music that is cussing. If they're in a foreign space, like where are they at and how comfortable are they and are they willing to really like let it all hang out or not is always interesting. So, is there such thing as too comfortable? Yes, I do believe so. A certain level of uh, professionalism, you know. So, I'm like. It's just interesting to see. It, is there like any red flags or like what would you expect? Like if somebody comes in and it's uh, I mean, obviously you're going to have like uh, I mean, like like the rap music is so interesting in terms of like and I remember guys I played with like I'm real like uh, classic in my rap music. Like it's got to be 80s, 90s gangster rap. Like that's kind of the genre of, of music I like for that. But some of this new stuff, I was like, oh, this is awful. Yeah. I pay attention a lot to just like how much people are talking. Like I was always um, told back in the day, like two ears, one mouth, you know? So like, are you just completely like blowing me up with information and just trying to like prove to me like, ah, like you need to hire me and da, 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 da. Or are you just like showing it through just like body language and just fitting with the staff and really trying to take in and ask good questions. So I think there's two ends of the spectrum when it comes to, to that as well, you know? Yeah, the challenge with the podcast, people get to listen to us and then they they feel like they know us and then meeting them for the first time. I've seen people too comfortable and like go in and 
try to impress John by ripping on me. And it's like, dude, I don't even know you. Uh, or, or the other weird one uh, is uh, we've done over 600 podcasts. Uh-huh. So uh, my they've kind of all <laughs> melted into one big podcast. And so people will listen and then they'll ask me uber specific questions about a podcast. And I'll be like, what day was that? When like seven years ago, you said this. And I'm like, Episode 247. Oh, yeah. 43. Dude, like I've, I've had that. I had a guy bust out. I was at Summerstone. A guy busted out like his phone. And he's like, hey, you said this and this and this. And I'm like, I black out, dude. You saw uh, <laughs> yeah. you saw Will Ferrell in old school when he like blacks yes. out. And he's like, what happened? That's like me after 600 podcasts. It just like they just all kind of melt together. And um, like there's no way I would have recall on that. So then I'm like, give me some context. Like, 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 what was I talking about? Who are we talking about? So I was asking for that context piece. But I'll make yeah. sure not to do that then if I see you at Summerstrong. Ah, uh, you see me at Summerstrong. <laughs> well, I'll remember this one just because uh, it's for so sure. rare that we get. Uh, no, we we've had some lady strength coaches on. We had um, was it uh, Megan from uh, the Seattle Sounders? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Megan yeah. Young. Yeah, Megan Young. Yeah, she was great. Um, yeah, we've had some some legit lady strength coaches on. Um. Well. Speaking career, so you, you've had an awesome path to get where you are, and it feels hometown and taking on a new role, incorporating sports science. Like, where, where do you see now in five years? Is it at full on athletic director? Are you in Pittsburgh still? Like, where, where's your dream job taking you? President of the university. <laughs> President. Oh, goodness. Um, I think it's been cool to be able to move back home because I've lived in the South the last eight years, five years at Clemson and three years down at Mississippi State. So I think it's been cool to get back up here. The snow, I forgot how terrible it is though, low key. So I think I'm, I'm getting adjusted to driving in the snow again. I'm already a bad driver and now we just put the snow outside. <laughs> well, I hope you're not driving, driving a Chevy, Are you, that you're not driving a Chevy Cobalt. No, I've upgraded to a Jeep. So I have four wheel drive. That's clutch. That's clutch. Nice. Um, I think what I really appreciate now in my career is just working around people that make me better, you know, and challenge me, whatever that may look like. I think just staying like every position that I've luckily gotten, I've just been staying present. And usually people will, like contact me and be like, Hey, are you interested in this position? Like, would love to have you here type of thing. I think there's been some unique opportunities open up for me, uh, when it comes to like the field continue to grow. And I was even on, um, like a month ago, the NFL women's forum, I think they're doing a really good job. They actually reach out to, I don't even know how they got my contact information, probably like sometime in January. Uh, someone had contacted me and said like, hey, would you be interested in, in possibly joining this? And I had to do like a couple steps. I had to send a video of myself speaking and answering questions. There was a questionnaire I had to fill out. Um, and then I had to do another round of another video of me speaking. And then they picked like 43 women to be a part of this NFL Women's Forum with like owners of teams, head coaches, uh, different position coaches, strength coaches, PTs. But um, I think that was really interesting to give me a little bit more of a, a scope of what the NFL looks like from uh, an ownership side with some of the owners speaking on it. And then also behind the scenes, like some of the performance staff and even head coaches, what they're looking for. Like I had asked in their strength coach at this point in time, because I feel like strength conditioning is, it was like old school now, Things are kind of full tilt coming forward to sports science, biomechanics is becoming a little bit more um, inclusive within the performance space and PTs. So that was a really cool opportunity um, that I was able to, to hop on and kind of see. I haven't worked in pro sports, so I'm definitely intrigued by it. But at the end of the day, I just want to work around uh, really good humans and then also just be able to find people I can learn from at a high level. So I think just, of course, being present in my current role and, and leading my staff and building out this sports science department um, and building this new weight room and a new lab. But I think I'm, I'm always pushing myself and pushing the envelope and I want to surround myself with really, really intelligent people that will push me day in, day out as well. So pro sports, maybe down the road at some point, one person I really look up to is uh, Tina Murray. Uh, she's with the Kings. Now she used to be at Louisville for a long time, but she made the jump to the NBA. But I think, uh, yeah, just working around good people. And I'm lucky to have found that here at Pitt and, now being over 19, like I was over nine sports at Mississippi State. Now I'm over 19 sports here at Pitt. So definitely a new challenge of trying to bring all these different people together and um, just hire the right people, you know, that, that bring a lot of worth to the table um, as human beings and as strength coaches or practitioners. I think hiring is something that uh, I've definitely tried to continue to evolve, whether it's the four Fs I had mentioned, but even the interview process like you guys are talking about and I'm even diving into like what it looks like to really interview a director of sports science. So I think um, whether it's 
like having them present on a case study, I think is part of the interview process I'm looking at, along with, of course, like the questions and a couple, like I, learned, I took some tidbits from that NFL Women's Forum as well with the, the videos. You, learn, you can learn a lot from a candidate by just sending like a 30 second video, you know, over to them, you can pick up, like usually within the first 30 seconds, you can kind of fall one way or the other of like, I could see this person working in my space or not. So I think uh, trying to really reach out to a lot of people to get feedback on that and continue to grow. Yeah, it's that real world interview where you had to film yourself and send it in. Remember that audition tape? What for the real world? You, yeah, you auditioned for, for the real world. I didn't make it, but then for jobs, oh, no. having them send in a real world audition tape. I like it, and then they earn the interview. Mm. That's a process we got to add into it. I think I might add that in. I got two interviews this week, dude. Not for me, but for interviewing other people. And Steph, yeah. if you need any help and assistance with a couple guys to take them around Pittsburgh or Philly. It's close enough. We got you. <laughs> yeah, we'll bring you guys in for sure. Director of Sports Science. I'm like, I have some guys. I'm in, yeah. I know some meatheads. Survive. Yes, yeah. this could yeah. be good. Can you guys yeah. hang in this space? Uh, I I don't know if I no, can go back. you guys can but the sports scientist. You guys can uh, ask him. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good on that spot. I think the only thing I would struggle with in college is uh, I'm, I wasn't, I wasn't raised like in a kind and gentle, uh, like I guess you could say way. And like when I was in college, it wasn't any, it was anything but kind and gentle and playing in the NFL is by far the world's greatest meritocracy. So like what's interesting for me, especially when I was doing my master's work, I did an education. I got asked to speak, uh, like I think it was in my fourth or fifth year. They asked me to come back and speak in a symposium, kind of an open forum. And I got into it with a whole bunch of the, uh, um, like the grad students, uh, because one, they didn't like the, the truth of what I was having to say. And, uh, you know, like it, and it just, I don't know. I have, I have a hard time giving collegiate narrative or to not hurt. Like, like I'm, I'm not going to change my opinion to avoid hurting your feelings. Like I always kind of thought that like higher education was the, like, you have to put yourself out there and potentially like battle people you know, with different ideas. And there was this idea of like thought process. And what I realized is they just wanted to exist in an echo chamber. And, uh, when I decided when I retired from the NFL about going back to school, I'm like, ah, man, I don't know if I could do that. It was just really interesting in terms of like having to navigate this kind of social construct that I don't know if I would do really well at. Um, whereas like a lot of times I think people want to hear their version of the truth, not necessarily the truth. And, um, I think, uh, it takes somebody that's a, a little bit of political and probably a little smarter than me to do it. Whereas, uh, you seem to have done very, very well in terms of like how to navigate this whole thing. Whereas I'd be like, Hey man, like, I think you should transfer. You suck, <laughs> you know? And, I and think I, it depends on the head sport coach for sure. Like some of our, like, I look at rest, like our head sport coach, he would be like, hell yeah, this guy's my dude. He wants them. He wants someone to be honest with the guys and really push them. So I think personality fit with the head coach is so important, you know, and even with football, I know like Zach, our head football training coach, he came from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the Mississippi State, Tampa Bay, and then up to Pitt to be the head guy. And him working in the NFL just gave him a, a different level of education of like, yeah, it's, it's a real deal. Like you guys say you want to go to the league, but like I've seen people's lockers get cleaned out like that, yeah. you know, when the roster cuts happen. So I think he can speak at a, a different realness level to the guys of he's seen it happen and, you may say one thing, but it takes the other thing. Not that I have that experience, Dan, if he does. So I think there's a lot no, of No, it's, in that. Uh, you hit it 100%. Like, uh, I remember in college, all these guys, I mean, the amount of dudes I saw with NFL tattoos on their arms in college that never got a chance to go play in the NFL, like, it was, uh, it, it was probably too many to count. And uh, that was always really weird to me, where I'm like, man, you tattooed that on your arm, but you're not willing to do all the things that's necessary to get you to that job. And um, yeah, I just, like, I, I always thought with athletes, you don't do anybody any favors by sugarcoating anything. And, you know, I like, um, at, at least for me, I always appreciated like somebody shooting me straight. If I wasn't good enough or I needed to improve, tell me like, you don't have to be vindictive and like try to hurt my feelings. But like at the end of the day, uh, honesty tearing off the band aid. And I thought that, um, when I went back and did that stuff at Cal, there was a lot of like, this is the narrative. This is what we're talking about. And like, you know, truth is, is, is subjective. And I'm like, man, I'm way too black and white for that. And, um, that's kind of why I avoided a little bit. Uh, but I also think, man, there's a place for that and everything And professional sports is, like I said, is a real meritocracy. And, uh, I always appreciated that because it's like, man, you know exactly how good you are based upon a lot of different factors. And like you said, you know, if you're not good, they just steal you away in the night, which happened to me at the end of the career. 
Steph, you had the honor of speaking at SummerStrong last year. Do you feel there's a step in the stage for you to begin a side hustle and speaking career? Yeah, man, no, that was a, it was pretty crazy because actually I was slated with COVID. I was slated to speak at like the summer strong like the year before. Right. And then they just kind of like slid those speakers along. So I had a little bit more time from a speaking standpoint to uh, get some more events under my belt. So I think summer strong is just such a, a unique opportunity because the people that come to that event are like all shapes and sizes, right. And all over the world, people that make knives for a living, professional hunters. There's a few strength coaches here and there, but I think that was definitely a step of me being able to speak at such a large event. that I was like, all right, like this is definitely a new notch in my belt of, I enjoy being able to help people. I mean, that's why like you guys put out great content and are able to help people in a, a different way with the podcast. I think speaking events, like I just spoke at something a couple weekends ago at my alma mater, uh, a clinic at West Virginia the amount of like young people that came up to me after that I have the ability to help. Like it's my job. People gave me opportunities coming up in the field. Uh, you guys had mentioned Megan Young. I remember I reached out to her like early in my career when I couldn't land a GA spot. And she just told me about persistence and staying after it. And like, you may apply to 50 jobs, but you need to apply to a hundred jobs, you know? So I think that honesty level, and I really enjoy speaking at events and I, I really would love to continue to do it at a high level just because you're able to give back and help people just like, I can be where I'm at without the multiple mentors that I've had that are all across the spectrum, whether it's pro sports, college sports, football, baseball, all the above. So I think, uh, yes, love speaking engagements. I think uh, definitely finding the right time and place, but being able to give back definitely holds a, a special place in my heart. So yeah, 100%. Any also, speaking engagements that come across my slate, I'm, I'm always ready for. Well, Sornix is also unique too, because it's almost like you're in a pit. You're like yeah, sitting cool. there and there's people around you. Your back's kind of it. And, you know, you're kind of, uh, uh, you know, at everybody's level. There's, uh, you know, no podium. It's like a fucking plyo box and there's TVs. Literally. It's just kind of like a, it's like, it's like a, um, it's like a chicken fighting. Like it's like a cockfight or something, you know, like a, a bull ring where you're kind of standing there and there's all these people and there's people above you. It's a, uh, it's a unique experience. I haven't spoken there. So I, I definitely dig it. Yeah. It's, it's a cool one. Uh, I mean, the scale of some fun NSCA ones, but still the the summer strong is is the ultimate experience. And if I mean you did crush that, so now any anything else in the future is going to be easy peasy. Yeah, yeah. no, I think uh, I've been speaking at a couple of different things, especially because like conferences are a thing again, which is super exciting. Uh huh. Um, but yeah, I think Thornex definitely does something special, uh, especially with their speaker lineup. It's like all across the spectrum as well, and you're standing literally on a platform, so. Um, definitely unique and thankful for that opportunity and more to come for sure. Yeah, no, it's good. I'm looking forward to it. Yes. And y'all are hosting a seminar coming up. This is our opportunity to shameless plug what you guys got going on at Pitt and then social following. Where can people learn more of what the good work you're doing? Yeah, shameless plug. So um, we're actually hosting the new FRS certification. So there's like functional range conditioning. FRA, the assessment, we're doing the third year that just came out most recently. They're actually at Cal Berkeley a hot minute ago. That was one of their stops. We're their East Coast location here at Pitt. We'll be hosting that here in a couple of weekends. And then also um, Speedworks, uh, a sprint profiling seminar. Half will be in the classroom. The other half will be out on the actual field um, doing some different sprint work, which will be pretty cool. It'll be May 1st. Um, and then we're looking at uh, actually putting on next year a sports performance clinic, um, hopefully maybe one with Catapult or maybe just one on our own and possibly creating a podcast coming down the line. We're looking into it to be able to put out some good content, uh, Pitt Sports Performance content or a uh, podcast. So I think that'll be good. But our Instagram page is at Pitt Sports Performance. Pretty easy to remember. Um, and then mine's just at Mox Stephanie or on Twitter at uh, Coach Steph Mox. So uh, yeah, shameless plug. There you go. All of us are just trying to put out some really good information, some good content, and also we're hiring some different positions. So look into it if you're uh, looking for a, looking for a job currently. Awesome, we'll definitely push that out. Sweet. Cool. All right, thank you very much for joining yes, us. Thank on you guys. Premier podcast, Strength Conditioning. Boom. Bye. Bye.